God, we just thank you that you command us to celebrate, that you command us to come together and celebrate you. And Lord, we pray that we would see you this night, that we would see you on every page and every aspect of the scriptures, and that you would just draw us closer to you. Lord, that you'd draw us more intimately connected with you and with one another. Lord, we pray for the person on our right and the person on our left. May their ears be open and may our hearts be open as well to receive. May we spur one another on in love and good deeds, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. How important are birthdays and anniversaries in your family's life? On a scale from 1 to 10, 1 being like, we could care less, and 10 being like, it is the most important day of the year. How many of you, you know, just shout it out. Five, eight. Who's, who's like an eight? Raise your hand if you're an eight. Hey, raise your hand if you're a one. Like, I could care less. Okay, there's a few. There's a few that are like, I don't celebrate birthdays. All right. Um, well, I've got some special days here that I want to see how well you guys know. So July 4th, what day is that? That's funny. July 4th. That's the 4th of July. Yeah, that's real profound. It's called Independence Day, right? Independence Day. But it's so off. It's, it's such a big day that we just call it the 4th of July. But it's, it's Independence Day. It's the day that we signed or our forefathers signed the Declaration of Independence, declaring our independence from Great Britain. Let's say, try another one. February 14th. What day is that? You guys are good. All right. A little bit harder. March 17th. A little bit slower, but you're getting it. Okay. Go a little bit harder. Ready? Ready? <clears throat> October 31st. And it's not Halloween. Uh, it is Halloween. But why is it significant? It's the day that Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis to the door at Wittenberg Castle. And the result was the starting the Reformation, calling the church back to the Bible. Now... That's not something to get dressed up and to be scary about, all right? Um, we actually are going to get some tracks that we'll have. We don't have them here tonight, but those of you that want to pass out tracks, when people say trick or treat, you say, how about a track or treat? And you can hand the track um, and share the gospel with people. All right, give me another day. How about um, a little bit harder, October 19th? <laughs> That's good. That's good. October 19th, any ideas? How about if I give you a year? October 19th of that year? Do you have it up there? You don't have it up there. Oh, I'm sorry. We changed it. September 3rd. I did change it. I forgot. September 3rd, 1783. No? What? Treaty of Paris. Who cares about the Treaty of Paris? Why is the Treaty of Paris significant? It was the end of the Revolutionary War. How come you guys didn't know that one? That was, that's an important day. It's, it's the day the British said, it was the day that the British said, we're going to stop chasing you. We're going to stop coming after you. Okay. Um, I got two more. September 11? Yeah, yeah, 9-11. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a day that we will not forget. We've, most of us were alive during that day. Uh, okay, one last one, July 17th. It is my birthday. That's right. That's an important day. I don't want you to forget that. That's my birthday, okay? I'm not going to tell you the year, but that's my birthday. It's an important day. Days, birthdays, anniversaries are important. They are. Don't forget your, your wife's your, your anniversary, right? That would be a bad thing, you know? We, anniversaries are important. Well, God has some special days, some birthdays, some anniversaries that he calls us to celebrate. And yet most of the Christian church really just kind of ignores them. And the Feast of Tabernacles... For most of Christianity, they don't even have a clue what it is, what it's about. The Jewish name, Sukkot. Is that a special thing you wear in the winter? What, I mean, people don't know. God says, no, it's important, and it says it's an eighth-day feast, seven days plus one, and I want you to celebrate it every year. So we're going to talk about that. Basically, the feast days, God has 70 appointed times, or 70 special days, 70 important dates, 70 anniversaries, if you will, that he wants us to know about. Now, once a week, he reminds us, Sabbath, we're called to rest. We're called to remember God at least once a week, to pause and take some time for him. That's, there's 52 of those in a year. There's seven days during the Passover feast of unleavened bread and first fruits. There's, seven, there's three additional one-day feasts, the 
um, Shavuot or Pentecost, Yom Teruah, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. That's the Feast of Trumpets in the New Year. And then Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, the covering, that day, that holiest day of year, the fast. It was called the Great Fast. And whenever you read the scriptures and it talks about that great day or the fast, it's talking about that day, Yom Kippur, the day that the Jewish sins, the sins of the nation were atoned for up until about 32 A.D., Interesting. If you missed that message, you can check that out online. And then there's one other feast, and that is the Feast of Tabernacles, which was a seven-day feast plus an extra eighth day. And Jesus fulfilled all of these feasts. His death, he fulfilled at Passover. Um, his burial fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and that, his, that the idea of canceling sin. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is purging the house of sin. Um, his resurrection fulfilled the Feast of First Fruits. His, uh, the, the church... And the Holy Spirit came at the Feast of Shavuot, or Pentecost. Um, that's where we get the word Pentecostal, because it's talking about people that are filled with the Spirit. The idea that that was something that came. It came 50 days after the previous feast, and that 50 days was significant. It was also the same day, the anniversary, if you will, that 3,000 people died because of the, the plague um, and, and um, worshiping uh, the golden calf. And it's the same day, years later, that 3,000 were filled with the Spirit and born again. And born again when Peter preached. Amazing how God, he loves to keep these days. He loves to t celebrate anniversaries. And, he, and uh, he keeps it going. Now, here's some things that are interesting to think about. The likely details of Jesus' birth are equally astonishing in that at conception, it's very likely, we're not going to go into it tonight, but I can show you afterwards if you're interested, how Jesus was likely conceived on the Feast of Hanukkah. The festival of lights, the light of the world came into the world on the Feast of Hanukkah. That the, um, we have his birth at the Feast of Sukkot during tabernacles. I think part of the reason that God wanted tabernacles to be celebrated and be such a party because he wanted everybody every year to celebrate Jesus' birthday. And it ain't December 25th. All right, it ain't December 25th. Unfortunately, it's, it's, it's in the fall. It's supposed to be, the idea is the Feast of Tabernacles, and I just want to, I, I don't have time to go into it in detail, but basically we know that um, Jesus' um, cousin, John, his parents, basically, because of the, the, the prophecies and what was told um, in, in the Gospels, we know when likely John was born, and then the fact that John's mother was the, the cousin of Mary, and the result of the connection, we can trace the dates, we can add up the math, and basically takes us to the fact that most likely Jesus was born on the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, the cool thing about that, too, is that the Feast of Tabernacles is a seven-day feast, and what happens to a, a baby boy on the eighth day? Snip, snip. All right? He gets circumcised. He actually doesn't even get named until the eighth day. Interesting. Interesting. And so here he is. This is Jesus fulfilling all this, um, likely his circumcision taking place on that great day. And on Simchat Torah, which is the eighth day. Simchat Torah is the day. See, the, the Jews have a, a tradition that every day there's a, there's, a, there's a Torah reading. And they read the entire Torah, the first five books of the Bible, throughout the year. And they start it over on the eighth day of tabernacles that on Simchat Torah. That's the day that it starts over. And do you know where it goes back to? Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, that's where we go back to. And so basically on that day, that's where Jesus is, is in a sense, he is uh, he's circumcised and he's, he's uh, given a name and that the fact is now Yeshua, salvation, is here. Fascinating how God's fulfilling all of these these prophecies. Potential fulfillments in the future, these are still, uh, there's a little bit of debate among people, but um, we know that Jesus fulfilled the spring feasts, Passover, unleavened bread, and first feast of first fruits to the day. So we expect that he's going to fulfill a prophetic fulfillment of the fall feast in the same way. And that likely the, at Yom Teruah, the feast of trumpets, the day that no one knows, is the rapture. The, the tribulation may likely begin with Yom Kippur or possibly with trumpets. There's some debate about that. And then, of course, the second coming at Tabernacles and this week-long celebration entering the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jewish history itself is actually circular in that the idea is that it, there's these things that happen and then there's anniversaries. We have an anniversary once a week. It's called Sabbath, all right? Or the Lord's Day is how most Christians celebrate. We celebrate on the Lord's Day, which is technically Sabbath is Saturday, and Sunday is the, the day of the Lord. That's the day that Jesus rose. And so we don't celebrate the resurrection or Easter. We don't celebrate that. We celebrate the resurrection every week. That's why we do it on Sunday. Did you know that? 
Most Christians, I just go to church on Sunday because my parents went to church on Sunday. My grandparents went to church on Sunday. No, we go to the church on Sunday because that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And we want to remember that every week. We want to remember that. That's why we go on Sunday. So um, one other thing I want to talk about in terms of tabernacles, it's interesting. Yom, Yom Kippur was the, the, the atonement for the Jewish people. The tabernacles, during the Feast of Tabernacles, there were 70 bulls that were sacrificed. And 70 bulls relate to the 70 nations that are recorded in Genesis 10. And so the tabernacles was basically the world being reconciled to God. And it's a party. When you're reconciled to God, it's a big celebration. When you realize your sins are forgiven, that's something to dance about. That's something to, to celebrate about. They just had five days before the Feast of Tabernacles, they had the, the most solemn day of year. They had a, uh, um, the, the fast. They were afflicting themselves. They were reminding them they were, they were penitent before the Lord, and they were, they were recognizing how far they were from God. And then five days later, God says, now celebrate the fact that you've been reconciled. Celebrate the fact that you have an inheritance. Celebrate the fact that you're going to spend time with God in eternity. One other thing about the, the tabernacles is that in the millennium, we're going to celebrate tabernacles. And you're like, really? Yeah. And it's a fascinating passage. We don't have time to go into all of it tonight, but Zechariah 14, you can read the passage and you can see when you read the early parts of the passage, it talks about Armageddon, everybody sieging Jerusalem, and then it talks about God wiping them out. And then it talks about in the millennium, this passage, Zechariah 14, 16, it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Interesting. Why does God make such a big deal about it? What's so big about tabernacles that in the millennium still we're going to celebrate tabernacles? And most Christians don't even celebrate today. Why? What's going on? Well, I think there's a lot of deception. There's a lot of misinformation. And there's a lot of lack of information. My people perish for lack of knowledge. Leviticus 23 is where we get the seven feasts, the seven major feasts of the Lord, and that's uh, where we're going to stop, start tonight. Leviticus 23, 33, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. You should do no customary work on it. For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly, and you should do no customary work in it. Okay, this is significant. Basically, it's in the seventh month, all right, on the seventh full moon, because the full moon is always the 15th of the month. On the seventh month, on the seventh full moon, you're supposed to celebrate this feast. And it's, once again, it's for seven days. And the first day you're supposed to do no work. The seventh day you're supposed to do no work. Uh, the eighth day you're supposed to do no work. And it's a holy convocation. He's saying, get your attention. Now, it's seven plus one, which is eight. Seven in the Bible is the number of completion. Okay, it's, we, Some people say it's God's favorite number because the Bible's full of sevens. But it's the number of completion. There's seven days in a week. Now, the interesting thing about eight is eight is the number of renewal, new beginnings. So we have seven days in a week, and the eighth day is a new, new week, all right? We have seven notes in a scale, and the eighth is the octave, which is the beginning of a new octave, a new scale. It's, a, it's eight. It's that number that keeps coming back. The eighth person was... Mm, oh, tricked you on that one. Eighth person... The Bible describes Noah as an eighth preacher, an eighth person, um, and he was the eighth person which began the new world, that, the one that we are in now, after the flood. Eight is that number that keeps coming back as that number of new beginnings. 6,000 years of recorded history um, that, uh, we, that we can trace. We're about to enter into the millennium sometime soon. We don't know when. I mean, the, the, the year, what year is it? Yeah, okay, I didn't fool you. Five, the, the year, according to the Jewish calendar, is year 5777, all right? 5777. Now, according to them, we've got 223 years until we get to the 6,000th year, but we don't know if they actually started with the right year. But basically, we've got about 6,000 years of recorded history. We're going to enter the millennium, which is another 1,000 years. So what happens after that 7,000 years? We'll enter a new heaven and a new earth. God says the new heaven and the new earth do not begin with the millennium. The new heaven and the new earth begin at the end of the millennium. And so once again, eight is that number of new beginnings, the beginning that God's starting something new, that, that idea. The eighth day is the, the day that the boy was circumcised and a name was given, something new. So Leviticus 23, verse 39, also on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day, there shall be a Sabbath rest. On the eighth day, a Sabbath rest. And you should take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, 
branches of palm trees, boughs of leafy trees, willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year, and it shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in the booths for seven days, and all who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses declared the children of Israel the feasts of the Lord. Okay, so here's how we get this idea of the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. It's a seven-day feast. They're supposed to celebrate basically under a canopy or under some type of a lean-to or a tent, and they were supposed to do it. Uh, they're supposed to take this offering of these uh, f- the fruit and the beautiful fruit, it says, um, and then the different types of tree branches. And it's kind of, a, kind of a strange thing. What was the point? Remember that they're wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, so they're in these tents. And God didn't want the future generations to forget the fact that their ancestors wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and that they were only protected by their tents. But their protection really was the Lord. There was that covering, if you will. The tent was that covering over them. And in in a sense, the Lord was their covering, protecting them in the wilderness. And here we have these four... They, they're called the four kinds. The etrog is a, is a fruit. It's kind of like a lemon. Um, it has a, a, a sweet smell and um, a, a very fragrant. Uh, the lulav um, was like a date palm frond. It, was a tasty, it had tasty fruit but no fragrance. The um, hadassim, which is the myrtle branch, no fruit but has a fragrance. And the willow branch, which had no fruit and no fragrance. And the, it's, it's interesting. The Jewish... Um, sages and rabbis, they would all write about these things, and, and you may have heard if you've got you know, three Jews in a room, you've got four opinions. And so there's, there's tons of things that they write about all these different... Um, some of you just got that. But the, the, they write tons of things about these, and so it's like, well, we don't really know what God intended on some of these things. But um, you know, some, would, some would say that the, uh, um, it, it actually compares to Matthew 13, where we have the four soils, um, and there's the soil that bears fruit. There's the soil that's the rocky soil. There's the soil that goes amongst the thorns. And there's the soil where the seed is dropped on the, on the path and the, the birds take it away. And so um, there's a lot of comparisons that we can make there. <clears throat> but it's something that they were, spo- they were called to do and they were supposed to take these. And remember, it's a harvest feast. It's a harvest celebration. And so they, they take these things as a reminder that thank you, God, for this past year and how you've blessed me. You know, and that's something, that, honestly, we should be doing regularly. Not just once a year. I mean... The actual Thanksgiving that we do is based on Sukkot. The pilgrims, I don't know if you knew this, they studied the Bible. Contrary to what they teach in schools now, they studied the Bible. They believed in the Bible, and so they chose the Thanksgiving. They didn't do it in late November, but they chose Thanksgiving as that time to celebrate the harvest, to celebrate and recognize that they made it through because of God. They made it through because of God's provision. And we need to be doing the same thing. And that's what this feast, that's what this this time of tabernacles is really all about. Now, these shelters, um, the Jewish tradition will tell you, well, it's got to have three walls and it's got to have palm fronds on top and you got to be able to see the stars. If you read the scriptures, if you read the Bible, it doesn't tell you all that. All it says is be in booths. And booths, another name for tabernacles, tents. Um, It's all saying the same basic thing. Um, but they've got the traditions that have built up around it. We, we celebrate it with tents, you know, and um, with, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to be authentic, you can make one. We, we made a, a sukkah of sorts out there. It's rather a large sukkah. It would be for a large family, and, um, but you're welcome to um, check it out after the service. Well, here we have, continuing on, um, the uh, Leviticus 23 41, you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. Notice it didn't say just to celebrate until Jesus comes. It says forever. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. And all who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses declared to the children of Israel the feast of the Lord. So we're all called to... to camp out. We're all called to do that uh, on an annual basis. Now, I, I know some folks that are actually, they're, they take the whole week and they went to North Carolina and they're camping out all the whole week. Beautiful thing, especially this time of year because it's a little, usually sometimes in the fall down here in Florida, camping out is not so fun, all right? The last couple of times I've camped out, it's the Sukkot's been earlier and it's been warmer 
and I'm sitting there baking with my kids. I'm like, oh, Lord, I, I know this is good and this is good for them, but I am, can I get a fan out here? Can I get some, you know, I bring, bring the extension cord and get in the, and a fan just blowing me, give me some air moving. And then we're, we're out there, this is, I think it was last year, we're, we're doing that on the first day of the feast. And um, the forecast says 0% chance of rain. So I, I leave the cover off of my tent so I can see the stars. And I talk to the kids about, you know, we're supposed to be able to see the stars and the fact that God created all the stars and Bible lesson and I see the clouds. And I look at my phone um, and it says no chance of rain, 0% chance of rain. And then it just starts raining. And I'm like, and I'm getting wet. And I'm like, Lord. Lord, send the storm away. And it just keeps raining. And I'm like, okay, boys, we're going inside. <laughs> um, now, we experience it, and they experience it, and they remember it, and they want to, they want to celebrate it because it's, it's something special. It's something different. But that's what we're called to do, regardless of the rain. We've got to be thanking God for the rain. Actually, that's one of the interesting things is that there's a whole water libation ceremony during this festival where they thank God for the rain. Because, of course, Israel's a, a, a much drier climate than Florida. And if it wasn't for rain, you don't, if you don't have rain, you don't have crops. You don't have life. And so really the rain brings life. And they're gonna, they celebrate that. Well, one other thing I want to mention, too, before we go into that, is that this festival, or the, or, um, the idea of tabernacling, is also very similar. The tabernacle was very similar to a sukkah. In other words, it was a tent. It was a mobile tent that was set up. Um, and you look here in, in Exodus 29, verse 43, God says, And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. So I will consecrate the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate both Aaron and his sons to minister to me as priests. I will dwell among them, among the children of Israel, and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them up out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Do you keep hearing that? I will dwell among them. The whole point of the tabernacle, it was God saying, I'm going to dwell among you. Now think about this. In that culture, God was far. God was distant. God didn't dwell among us. God didn't do that. God didn't just come down and say, how's it going? How are you? And you're like, okay, he's being weird today. No, no, but that's just the idea is that God is saying he wants to dwell among them. Now, interesting, because this passage, if you, if you study the scriptures, it was right after they had sinned big time. But God said, I still want to dwell among them. And that's, he's still the same way. It doesn't matter how far we've fallen. He still wants to dwell among us. Now, he's calling us to repentance, but he wants to dwell among us. And, of course, he later he speaks to Moses face to face, it says. And so the tent was for meeting with God. The, the tent, the tabernacle was to meet with God. That was the purpose of tabernacle. So this Feast of Tabernacles, we don't really think about it, but really it's to meet with God. It's to spend time in the tents of God. Now, John 1.1, 1, 1, we all know the scripture, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Later on in verse chapter 1 is, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Of course, this is speaking of of Jesus, right? But that word dwelt among us in the original language, that word is tabernacle. So Jesus tabernacled among us. Isn't that interesting? The word that John chose, he's writing to his Jewish audience and, and he tells him, and God, Jesus. Okay, first he says that Jesus is God. In the beginning was the word and the word was God. Jesus was God, and he came and he dwelt. He tabernacled among us. It was a temporary dwelling. You and I live in a temporary dwelling. This is just temporary. This, this, this flesh will rot, decay, and go away. But we'll have a resurrection body that will never perish. And right now, sometimes we have to recognize that um, we, we don't treat... Some, some of us treat this body like it is temporary, <laughs> like we don't, we don't take care of it. But some of us treat our houses as if they're not temporary. You know, I'm in the process of, of selling my house and buying a new place, and, and the Lord blessed us in that. We, we bought a house down in Boca a few years ago, and in that time, just in the, the few years that we were down there, the house appreciated significantly. In about three years, it, it, it appreciated almost 40%. Totally the Lord, totally a blessing from the Lord. So I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to move on up. So what I'm thinking, I'm selling my house in Boca, and I'm going to move up here to Lake Worth to be closer to the church, and I'm thinking, okay, Lord, 
where do you want me to be? And I'm looking at these houses because I've got, you know, I've got this equity in this house, and so I can use this equity to get a little bit nicer place, you know, and just kind of move on up. And we're looking at these places and looking at these places, and the Lord's closing doors, and the Lord says, what if I ask you to take something a little bit more humble? Well, I could do that, Lord, but I know you don't want to. I know you want to bless me because I'm a king's kid. <laughs> yeah, about that. I, I was I'm like, well, but Lord, you know, you know, I've, I've, this is my this is my third house, and we've been my wife and I've been faithful and been good stewards. So, you know, I just want to get a little bit nicer. I mean, I'm not extravagant, just a little bit nicer. You've you've blessed me with the money that I can do that, right, Lord? So I just want to do something. And the Lord says, well, what about something a little bit more humble? Yeah, but but <laughs> do you trust me? Yeah, but anytime you say yeah, but to the Lord, there's a problem. Yeah, but. Yeah, but is, a, is, is not, a good for, not a good term for the Lord. Yeah, but. That's like Peter telling Jesus. Yeah, but Lord, no, no, no one will do that, Lord. I'll never deny you. Yeah, but Jesus, no, you shouldn't do that. You'll, nobody's ever going to do that. And, and, and God's like, ah, get behind me, Satan. That's where yeah, buts come from. They do. Yeah, buts come from Satan. Yeah, but, but, and so I, the Lord, okay. So we're, we're getting, you know, it's, it's still a nice house. I, I don't want to make you think that I'm getting a shack. But, but the Lord, but the, it's a lot smaller than I was anticipating. I'm, I'm, I had a, I had, we had a five-bedroom house in Boca, and now we're getting a three-bedroom house with all of our kids crunched in there. Um, but God is faithful. God is faithful. And so, anyway, um, and, and just I, some of you are thinking, wow, they pay, pay pastors well. No, I know some of you are thinking that. Um, I want to tell you, there, the Lord blessed us before I became a pastor, okay? I didn't, it wasn't because of ministry, because that isn't the case, okay? Yeah, I just want to make sure. Just make sure. Anyway. <laughs> All right. So, we get to this place where the tabernacling among us, Jesus tabernacled among us. But here's the cool thing. His tabernacling among us was to show us not just who he was, not just what he could do, not just that he loved us. There's a couple things that happened. The tabernacle ceremony, there was this water libation ceremony. And the water libation ceremony was basically for seven days, they would take a, about a half a liter pitcher of water and, and actually wine, and they would, they would have this big procession. They would go from the, the Pool of Siloam, which is down at the base of, of Jerusalem, one of the lower parts of Jerusalem. They would climb the Mount, Mount Moriah, basically, up to the Temple Mount, and then they would march around the Temple Mount, around the, the altar, and they would pour. They had it specially designed. They'd pour water in one side, and they'd pour the wine in the other side so that we'd have, in a sense, blood and water flowing. And they would flow down and reach at the same time. And they would pour this water out, thanking God, thank you, God, that you provide the water. And it was also during the fall, which was the, the, the celebration of the wine, of the, uh, the grape harvest. And so they would pour the wine as well. So the blood and the water flow. Now, here's the other thing that happens. During the, and they did that for seven days. Okay? Each day they're pouring it out, and they're, and they're saying different things, some amazing things. They, one of the psalms that they say or sing was Psalm 118, one of the Halal Psalms. And it's uh, the center verse of the Bible is in Psalm 118. And I want to read this verse to you because it's interesting. You know, what's, you know, it's right smack dab in the center. If you, if you go take all the chapters of the Bible and you find the center chapter of the Bible, it's Psalm 118, verse 8. It says, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Or woman, or Donald, or Hillary, <laughs> right? You fill in the blank. Better, put, better to put trust in the Lord than to trust in man. We don't trust in the ballot box. We trust in the prayer closet, right? And so as we're getting ready for that, uh, another date that's on the horizon, um, be in prayer uh, for what's coming up. But Psalm 118, verse 14, the Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. I love this little psalm. This is what they would sing, and this is what they would declare during the Feast of Tabernacles, right? So they're, they're, all Israel, one of the things I forgot to mention is that all Israel had to gather together on the Feast of Tabernacles. So the entire nation, all the men had to, and usually they'd bring their, their families, they would all come to the, celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, right? And they would sing this psalm. And what, notice what it says, the Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. The word salvation in Hebrew is Yeshua. And what is Yeshua? That's the Hebrew name for Jesus. 
So interesting. Read that verse again. This is what they're singing. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my Jesus. The voice of rejoicing and salvation, Jesus. Jesus is in the tent of the righteous. Wait, the tents? Yeah, this is the song. This is what's sung during tabernacles. They're celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, and they don't even realize they're singing. You know, what it would it be like if they're saying, you know, they're singing your name during a feast? You'd be like, yeah, that's pretty cool. They're singing my name. But none of our names, for the most part, really mean anything. You know, the name April means, like, the fourth month of the year, okay? And um, there are some things like that. But for the most part, our names don't have that same significance. But the name Yeshua, that was salvation. His name was salvation. His name was salvation. And here they're saying the name Yeshua, the voice of rejoicing and salvation, Yeshua, Jesus, is in the tents of the righteous. They're singing about him, and he's right there in their midst, and they don't get it. Amazing. This psalm, you know some of the later verses in this psalm. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation, my Yeshua. The t- stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. We know that's messianic, but how many of us missed that the first part of the whole of that chapter of the psalm is messianic talking about jesus that jesus was rejected and has become the chief cornerstone verse 24 this is the day the lord has made we will rejoice and be glad in it this is the day you know we sing if you were old timer this is the day this is the day okay we don't sing that song anymore okay because if you sing it you got to be the back this is the day this is the day. yeah 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 all that stuff and those of us that are like older we knew that song that was like that was the that was the song years ago and we sang that and most of us sang it just like we're celebrating the fact that this is a day god made this day the psalm is really talking about tabernacles the psalm is really talking about the feast of tabernacles it's talking about jesus birthday also talking about his wedding day we're going to get there um, look here then, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. Great, great picture. And then finally, the end of the psalm. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Ooh, also powerful. During the Feast of Tabernacles, um, they would have these huge... Um, basically, there's huge menorahs, but they would, they would be, I forget how tall, but they would stand incredibly tall above, above the temple court, and they would put in each, each candelabra, they would put five gallons of oil, okay? That's a lot of oil in just one little area. And then they would, like, they would take the priests, the old priests' garments, they would take the old priests' garments from the year that had kind of worn out, and they would use them as wicks, and they would burn those lights. And the lights would be so bright, the testimony is from the... From the that time that you could see the lights. You know, it's like, you, you, you know, you see those things um, when people, they have a, an event going on and they, they shine lights straight up in the sky and you see it. Basically, it lit up the entire area of Jerusalem. Here it's saying in this verse, they're singing this in Psalm 118 about the light. He has given us light. It's on that eighth day of the feast that Jesus declares, I am the light of the world. The light's shining, and, God, and Jesus is pointing at, yeah, actually, I am the light of the world. You think that light's bright? I am the light of the world. All those things. We miss it because we don't know our Bible. We don't. We just read it. It's like, oh, that's a good story. I'm, Jesus is the light of the world. So then we fi- finish it up. He's given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horn of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God. I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Well, so they have this water libation ceremony. They would bring the water. Seven days, they would pour out the water. They'd pour out the wine. On the seventh day, they would, they would march around seven times around the altar in a circle, and they would have an empty jar, and they would pour it out, recognizing that not that the water had stopped, but they would pour it out, recognizing that they've entered the promised land and that they'd no longer have to bring the water with them, that God would continue to provide the water. They're recognizing God's provision. It's at that moment... When they're pouring out the water, and there's no water, that Jesus says, if any man thirsts, let him come to me. So the water's being poured out, but there's no water coming, and everybody turns to Jesus, because just think about it, this, you know, it's, it's like a church service going on, and somebody interrupts the, ser- the pastor speaking. Everybody's like, whoa, 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 what's going on? And that's what happens. The high priest pours it out. He's making this big ceremonial procession. 
Nothing comes out, and Jesus steps out and says, if any man thirsts, let him come to me. Let him come to me. Jesus is saying, I will give you, um, from you will flow streams of living water. That's what he wants to give to each of us. That's the relationship. That's what this is all about. The, um, the other thing about this feast is the, um, they would do this procession. Remember we talked about the willows? And they would take the, the, the branches. Um, I just want to read this to you. The, um, um, they would have a, a flute player um, that would be playing as they would have this, as the water procession is going on, there's a willow procession where they're taking the willows, bringing it, and they're, and they're taking the willows and, and saying that it's the, the spirit is coming. So we have the water, we have the wine, which represents the blood, and then we have the spirit, and that the procession is, that is coming, and that spirit procession, um, there's a flute player that's playing, and the flute player is called the pierced one because they take a, 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 a flute, basically, it's just got the holes po- poached, poked in it, right? So the one that is ushering in, if you will, the spirit is the pierced one. Who is our pierced one? Jesus. Every, pic- every part of this, every picture of it points to Jesus. Finally, in, in Isaiah 12, one of the, the passages that they would recite and that they would sing during this period, Isaiah 12, 1, And in that day you will say, O Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And in that day, you will say, praise the Lord, call upon his name. Declare his deeds among the people. Make mention that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, O inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. Amazing, just the celebration that God has done. We thought that we were far from God at Yom Kippur, but now we enter at um, Feast of Tabernacles and we celebrate our closeness to God. And yet, if we reread that same passage, and remember, all those words salvations really are supposed to be speaking of Jesus, speaking of Yeshua. Here, here's that same passage. In that day, so this is the passage that they're reading and they're not even realizing it. In that day, you will say, O Lord, I will praise you, though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away. And you comfort me. Behold, God is my Yeshua, Jesus. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah the Lord is my strength and song. And he is also, God has also become my Yeshua, Jesus. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of Yeshua, Jesus. And in that day, you will say, praise the Lord, call upon his name. All these things pointing to the fact that salvation is in Jesus and the fact that Jesus is in our midst. Well, John 7, that's where Jesus cries out that, on that last day, that great day of the feast. Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay, last thing I want to mention, and that is, how does this at all relate to a wedding? Well, in a traditional Jewish wedding, they would have what's called a chuppah. And the chuppah was basically a tabernacle. It was basically, uh, in, in, in a traditional wedding, they didn't have any sides like our, our, our tabernacles out there, but it had a top, a canopy that was above. And it was represented that the, as the couple entered that canopy, they were entering their own house, if you will, and starting their own home, their own family. Now, look at these I want to just point out what the, the traditions were in the, the, when we look at the Jewish wedding. The Jewish wedding betrothal, there were five parts. The groom would pay the bridal price to the father of the, of the bride. The groom and the bride would share a cup of wine together. The groom would give gifts to his bride. And the marriage contract would be agreed upon and kept by the bride until the consummation of the marriage at the wedding. And finally, the groom would return to his father's house to prepare a place for his bride upon his return. Now, if you've studied the Bible with us for a while, some of that stuff's like, hmm, whoa, oh. But if you haven't, uh, let me just point it out. The groom would pay the bridal price. Well, the bridal price for you as the bride of Christ was Jesus paying, giving his life. The groom and the bride would share a cup of wine together. That was that last supper, that sense of communion that we celebrate every time we meet. The groom would give gifts to the bride. Those are the 
the spiritual gifts that we receive. When we come to Christ, we receive spiritual gifts. Even though we're not yet married to Christ, we are betrothed to him, and he gives us spiritual gifts. The marriage contract would be agreed upon and, that, and kept by the bride. The marriage contract is that Bible you have in your hands. That's the promises of God, and we keep it, we hold on to it, we reflect on it and remember it, and it gives us hope when we're waiting. See, what, you, what we forget is that that groom, he, there would be this wedding, and it could be arranged. Sometimes the weddings, the, the betrothal process could be years long. It was usually at least a year, and part of that was to check to make sure that the bride was still a virgin, that she wasn't taken by somebody else. But they would, sometimes it could be, um, the couple could be arranged at birth. And so th they don't know. The bride doesn't know when she, he's coming. And so she's just told to wait. She's told to wait. When is, when is he coming? When is he coming? And he would go to prepare a place for us. That reminds us, of course, of John 14. Before Jesus left, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. I'm, I, basically, Jesus went away because he's preparing a place for us. Just like this wedding betrothal process, he went away to prepare a place for us, and he's going to come back to take us to be with him in his Father's house, just like in the Jewish wedding tradition. Now, what's interesting, too, is the wedding ceremony. This is where the chuppah... Um, happens. This is where the, the, the canopy happens. The bride, during this ceremony, the bride would come and would circle the groom seven times. Now, that's kind of weird. Except for the fact that what did they do in the Feast of Tabernacles? They would circle the altar seven times and then pour out the vase. That's seven times as a reminder of the, that the, everything should focus around the bride around the groom, and focusing on, on, on Jesus and that he's our bridegroom. But the bride would come around seven times. They would enter the chuppah, and that was the, the signal of the wedding ceremony. And to tradition is today that would, you, know, you could see in. The original chuppah was, was basically, that's where the, the, the wedding was consummated, okay? And there were sides, so people couldn't look in. And it, literally, that's, they'd enter it, and it was, hey, it was done, and they're going to come, and they're going to come out and celebrate they're going to have a week-long party, seven-day party celebrating the wedding, which is what Tabernacles is, a week-long party, seven days. And finally, God says, at the tabernacle, I will meet with you face-to-face. -face. That's what Tabernacles is about. It's really about the wedding and, and that celebration. It's entering in. It's entering the chuppah and entering in in the most holy way, in the most beautiful way, the most personal way, the most intimate way, husband and wife intimacy, going deeper than husband and wife intimacy. Um, Genesis 2.24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife were not ashamed. Jesus left his father that he could come and be joined with us. Now, there's a lot of people that say, well, have you invited Jesus into your heart? Now, the scripture does, there's nowhere in the Bible where it talks about Jesus into your heart. But there is, in 2 Corinthians 13, it says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Jesus left to come to be with you and to be in you. See, in the Jewish tradition, it would talk about the, 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 bride, the bridegroom leaving the father to enter into the bride. It's kind of a curious, why would he enter into the bride's chamber? Because he's entering into this chamber. He wants to enter into your chamber and to be, what was it that in Genesis 2, that they were naked and unashamed. And yet most of us in our walk with the Lord, we're not naked and unashamed. Pastor Jacob talked about it last Sunday with costumes with barriers, with, we've got shame, and we cover ourselves up because I just don't want God to see. And we see in Genesis 3 that that's what happened with Adam and Eve. They covered themselves up in their sin. We all cover ourselves up. The Feast of Tabernacles is saying, no, I want to enter in. I want to see. I want to enter into the tabernacle. I want to enter into the chuppah. I want to enter in, and I want to see God face to face, and he wants to see me, and that we could be naked and unashamed. The word face, the implication in the Hebrew is that to, to shine out what's on the inside. In fact, the word means countenance, okay? So when we look at a person's face, what do you see? When you look at my face, you're seeing what's on the inside. I'm like, I'm, I'm not amused. I'm like, I'm bored. I'm frustrated or whatever. But if you see my face, I can't wait. 
I can't wait. Now, some of you are saying, yeah, that was Pastor Jacob showing you the fake smile <laughs> from, from last Sunday or from a couple of weeks ago here on, on Friday nights. The, the point being, there are lots of faces that we make, but the idea that when we face to face, we're seeing what's really inside the person. God says that he wants to meet with us face to face. Are you ready to drop your fig leaf? Are you ready to enter the tabernacle and celebrate God's goodness? Are you ready to take this week-long party, which technically I haven't told you, it actually started a couple days ago. It ends, what is it, end uh, tomorrow, yeah. We started late, but we, we chose this because it was the weekend and just made it easier, and uh, I, don't, I don't know if God likes that or not. I think we'll have to ask him next time. But point being, point being, what is God calling you to tonight? We're going to sing a song. I'm, I'm going to ask them to, they're going to sing, um, I think it's Freedom. Um, and God has done so much for us. And we just kind of just hang on to it and like, yeah, yeah, it's cool. No, it's a time to celebrate. It's a time to, to rejoice. It's a time to dance and sing. Thank you, God, for what you've done. Sometimes we're pretty stoic as Christians. That, that Jewish dance that we, that we witnessed here, that was a traditional Jewish dance with uh, some added good stuff there um, from, our young, from our young adults. And um, they did a great job but they were having a great time. Yeah, that's right. And I, I'm sure if we ask Winston, he'll show everybody how to do it outside. Where are you, Winston, right? Yeah, let's go. So that we can, we'll, we'll crank the stereo out there and, and, and do that outside. We, we talked about actually making some room, but there just wasn't room to make room for everybody to join in the dance. But that's the point. It's supposed to be a celebration, getting up and dancing. It's a, it's a time of eating together. It's a time of remembering thankfulness. Take that time. Today, that's that day. Today's that day. Yes, this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's pray. God, we thank you. You are so good, and you are so faithful, and you are so loving. And God, sometimes we are so not into it. God, forgive us. God, we want to come to you. We want to take this day and celebrate it for what it is. Celebrate it. Celebrate it as, as a wedding feast, as an as a anniversary of a wedding feast before it happens. It's a celebration of your birth, of your first coming, and of your second coming. It's a celebration of all that, you're, of, that you do, of your goodness. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for meeting us here. May we see you. And Lord, may we have the confidence and the courage to drop the fig leaves, to drop the costume, and be one. That you would truly come in and search our hearts. And know us and try us and see if there be any wicked way. Lord, we know that you will in no way cast out those who seek you. And that we will seek you. And if we seek you with all of our heart, your promise, your word says that we will find you. Lord, we desire that. In our heart of hearts, we desire that. There's a part of us that struggles. But Lord, in our heart of hearts, in the spirit, Lord, may our spirit get stronger and our flesh get weaker. That we would pursue you with all that we are. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.